Good afternoon. We're excited you have joined us today. I'm Julie Woodward with the Oregon Forest Resources Institute, and it's my pleasure to be your host for today's Tree School Online webinar. Tree School Online is a production of the OSU Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Program and the Partnership for Forestry Education. We want to give special recognition to OFRI for leading this project and to the US Forest Service and the Oregon Department of Forestry for giving us a grant to help us with these Tree School Online. These are um, scheduled now twice a month and will continue into 2021. So we hope you'll come back and join us for even more of these. A couple of things as we get going with this Zoom. Many of you have probably done Zoom now over time, but uh, a toolbar should be located at, usually at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, you can scroll your cursor over an area and it should pop up. Uh, on some hardware such as iPads, the Zoom toolbars might be at the top of the display. Just to let you know, with the webinar, your audio is muted, as well as your video. You'll just see those of the speakers. Um, if you have any questions, we appreciate if you would write those in the Q&A box. Again, just click Q&A and you'll be a box that you can type into any questions you have throughout the presentation. The chat that you also see, um, we ask if you use that more for if you have any technical problems. Uh, this will be monitored throughout by Amanda Brenner, who's helping co-host today. And if you want to just send the panelists or speakers any messages, but we appreciate those questions going in the Q&A. Um, and if you know we might have resources, uh, we'll probably mention some today. And if you go to the same place where you registered on that Tree School Online class guide, you can um, easily reach that through the Know Your Forest website. And if you go to the class for today, you'll find the resources that are associated. Also in that same spot, you'll find if you're looking for any credits for OPL, Master Gardeners, um, you can, again, it's in the resource section. The webinar is being recorded today and will be archived on our YouTube videos and accessible from the Tree School Online page. Uh, we'll be doing a few polls throughout today and they should just pop right up and you should be able to answer those questions. If not, again, on that toolbar, you should be able to click poll and you'll be able to answer the questions. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our presenter today. And Dr. Jaguermo Jolinko is um, a professor in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Oregon State University. And his research focuses on ecology and watershed management of fisheries. He holds degrees in biology, resource management, and environmental studies. As an extension specialist, he shares his expertise with extension agents, government agency personnel, watershed councils, and the public on fish habitat restoration, aquatic ecology, fish ecology and behavior, fish passage issues, and the integrated watershed management. So I'm excited that we're gonna learn more today about fish habitat and riparian management. Guillermo, are you able to turn on your camera and microphone? Um, there we go. Looks like I'm there somehow. <laughs> well, uh, this is the oddest, but uh, we'll we'll plow through it somehow. I hope people are there. It's hard not to see people and know how they are reacting and when they are dropping dead and tired of me, but. Uh, <laughs> We'll do our best. So thank you, Julie, for the introduction. As um, Julie mentioned, I uh, in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at OSU. Uh, in January, I'm, I'm two short, two months short of 20 years uh, with uh, wow. with my employer, and I'm very happy about it. It's been a great relationship, working with fantastic people, not just at OSU, but across the gamut of agencies, both state and federal, as well as private companies, uh, um, the dam projects in different parts of the state, as well as the public and watershed councils and soil and water conservation districts. Um, there are not two days that are the same, and I really love that. Uh, well, today we're going to be talking a little bit about the uh, habitat needs of salmonids specifically, but we can discuss other fish as we go along. Uh, but the good thing about focusing on salmonids is that not only originally they were in the majority of our systems, but they are in many cases so sensitive to water quality and habitat degradation, then we know that when they go, 
all the other species are also being affected because it's the next step is uh, basically downhill um, degradation in the system. And we like to consider them a little bit like the canary in the mine uh, uh, that will indicate if the environment is not really healthy for other creatures. Um, I will start, let's see if this works. <laughs> the control, oh, there we go. Yes, okay. I yeah, guess. so yes, tell me. Before you jump in too far, let's me do a quick opening poll and then I'll let you have it. Oh, okay. So okay. we want to uh, ask, we have 45 people joining us today. So they are out there. And uh, we just have three questions we'd like to start off with and asking uh, participants, where are you from? And if you can select the region that's uh, most identified with your area about yourself, um, if you're a woodland owner or natural resource professional or other, and then if you do have forest land, how many acres you own and um, just helps give us some idea of who's joining with us today. So we'll give that just another minute and then uh, I'll share those results and then it'll be all yours. So people, it's voting day today. So people are used to voting. Hopefully everyone's gone out and voted. So these are easy polls and we have instant results unlike everyone that's waiting for results today. Uh, so right now the opening um, poll we're looking at, it looks like the majority 56% is in the Willamette Valley area. Uh, but we have people coming from all over coastal, southwest, central, or eastern Oregon, um, quite a few from Washington, and then just other places around the U.S. So a diversity of audience today for almost 50 people now that have joined us. And then um, many of them, about 44%, are woodland owners, and about 8% uh, our natural resource professionals, we also have agency professionals. So, and then others that, um, that other category was popular. And then uh, let me just uh, share those with everyone so you can all see those. And um, we have a variety of landowner sizes that are joining us today. So um, sounds like a diverse audience and appreciate everyone that's come in to um, hear about this important topic. So thank you. All right, now back to you. Okay, thank you, Julie. Interrupt me when I keep going and you're- No, you're good. Something else. Um, that was good to know. I didn't, I didn't realize we were going to have those data. And the sense that there are people somewhere there <laughs> is motivating for the speaker. Well, um, I assume a lot of you may be familiar with Salmonid life cycle, but I hope that I'll be able to add information that will complete that picture uh, in a significant way for you. Um, and if you have any questions, please use the chat and Julie will help me uh, make sure that we address them. But we're going to cover that initially and I'm trying to move on to the next, I'm not sure why. Okay, good. Sometimes it responds, sometimes it doesn't. This is interesting. Then we're going to focus on the aquatic habitat components, how we can look at the elements that make the habitat or the places where these fish live. And then we're going to be relating the riparian vegetation, which might be of particular interest to many of you, to the uh, uh, habitat of the fish. Because as a matter of fact, uh, although you may not look at it that way, uh, the riparian corridor is part of the habitat of the fish. It may become so very clearly on a seasonal basis, but even when it's not wetted and underwater, the contribution it makes to the fish and other creatures in the aquatic system is very significant. So the traditional life cycle, uh, which is shown in this diagram, we can start, let's see, I hope everybody can see my arrow, is the mouse pointing. And if we started with this face here with a, an adult that says, silvery fish heading for the spawning areas. That would be the adult spawners migrating up rivers, entering the system. Normally during that period of time, they may change colorations, they may develop uh, secondary sexual characteristics like humps in males or hooked snouts. Uh, that's very obvious in pink salmon and to uh, another uh, significant degree in sockeye salmon, which are not the species you're most often going to find here in Oregon. Pink are not found here any longer and sockeye are restricted to a few lakes. Um, but the others also change. Uh, coho salmon becomes sort of a dark red, and that's quite noticeable. And it helps tell them apart from other species spawning at reasonably the same time. 
Uh, Sokai can be, uh, sorry, Chinook can be told reasonably well because of their size. But even if you're dealing with a slightly underdeveloped adult, the brownish marble coloration is also setting it apart from the other two options that might be Cham. If you were on the coast, that looks more like grayish marble and quite battered down. It's a fish that when it arrives in the spawning grounds, it looks more uh, uh, falling apart, if you will. The skin falling off, peeling off with big blobs of white skin covering fungus and a sort of a red areas like bruises. Uh, and it's also large like a Chinook in many ways. Uh, so people could may confuse it with that. However, if you are in the interior, even a few hundred miles from the coast, cham are not likely to be present there. They normally occur on the coastal streams and particularly from the center, central part of the coast to the north and then into Washington and British Columbia. The spawning, the spawning, as you know, takes place uh, taking advantage of gravel. And we're going to complete this cycle and then I'll show you pictures about the specific uh, requirements. So imagine the adults spawning here, you have the pair, uh, the female lay, lay the eggs and the male uh, fertilizes them at the right time when the eggs are being pretty much released into the water column. They are not buoyant, so they sink into the uh, pocket that the female had just dug. And every pocket uh, basically is dug by the female. And when they, after they finish laying a set of 300, 400, 500 eggs in a pocket, depending on the species, those are the numbers that pretty much range. Uh, she tends to move slightly upstream and after taking a break, they start digging again. And in the process of doing so, it covers partially or totally the first pocket or nest that she dug. Now the entire area where she ends up digging anywhere between three and nine of these pockets is, considered, is called the red, R-E-D-D. -D. And you can spot them on the uh, streams because it looks like someone uh, swept the gravel clean of all the debris and algae that normally would be covering other parts that were untouched. So you will see the kind of a brownish gravel with these cleaner oval shaped areas. Uh, and those normally are the areas where the females have been working and laying their eggs. And those are the reds that fish biologists refer to. They're a good surrogate for fish numbers. In many cases, we just count numbers of reds over time to see how strong a particular run is compared to previous years. Um, it's not an absolute number. We never get absolute numbers with fish, but we get relative numbers compared to the past and future and recent years. And we can tell whether things are going in the right direction or the population in certain years in particular has taken a hit and we end up getting very few spawners. The egg turns into um, the alevin that you see here with the yolk sac um, after the, the alevin has gotten to the size where the eggshell is ba basically constraining its uh, size, its growth. But it remains, while it has that yolk sac, the alevin remains in the gravel for three to five more weeks uh, and then emerges. And that's the phase we call emergence that here in general, in Oregon, we can say it may take place towards the end of January or early part of February. And again, it depends on the species we're talking about. But a rule of thumb for anyone interested in salmon it, is that the warmer the waters, the faster the development, since the temperature of the body and the metabolism of fish is controlled by the temperature in the environment, in this case, the water. So if you're looking at streams in California, probably you're looking at shorter periods of incubation earlier emergence and faster growth. On the contrary, if you are in Alaska, you're probably looking at much longer periods of incubation in the gravel, much later emergence, and a much shorter window in the summer for the fish to grow. Then, depending on the species, the fry may move immediately into the estuary and then into the, the ocean. And that would be mostly the case for species such as chum or pink, uh, that are coastal uh, huggers or dwellers, and they don't remain in fresh water for very long. And then they would stay in the ocean for several years until they return back to spawn between three to five years later. Um, again, depending, in the case of pink, it's always a two-year cycle. Sorry, I should make that clear. But chum, they have different 
uh, lifespans depending on the stock and the individual. Um, when we look at other species like coho, which is an important species here because it's listed and there is a lot of regulations that have been put in place to protect wild stocks of coho salmon, um, they have two slightly different uh, life histories. In reality, we have discovered four, but for the simplicity of this presentation, we're going to just keep it in 70% of the population roughly of the freshly emerged fry will remain in fresh water for a whole year until they move into the estuary when they are about 12 to 13 months old, the following spring, basically. While there is about 30% of the juveniles that move into the estuary um, within weeks or a couple of months of emerging from the gravel. And they will actually hang around the estuary for the rest of the summer, fall, and even in, in some cases, the whole winter. So they will leave the system and enter the ocean a year later, like their siblings that remain upstream, but having reared in the estuary rather than in the stream. So there are those two type of life histories that we, we came to terms with the la in the last 15 or 18 years. In the past, the estuary reading phase of coho wasn't really uh, appreciated. Um, it wasn't recognized. They thought that those fish would die and now we know better. Um, so we have in this cycle here, the juveniles, again, they may stay in the stream or move into the ocean right away. If they enter the coastal waters where they forage and grow, they may stay within close to the coast, which tends to be the case of coho, for instance, or the sea run cutthroat trout. But they, you know, uh, in contrast, they may go into open waters, migrate all the way to Alaska, spend a couple of winters or more feeding in an area that's known as the Alaskan gyre that is immediately south of uh, Western Alaska at the Aleutian Islands, that area which is extremely productive and where the fish find a lot of food. And that would be the case for steelhead and Chinook in particular and sockeye, which again, we have very few of here in the, in the state. So again, a quick review, a uh, picture of a female spawning and you see uh, when you go to the river the ones batting their tails against the gravel are the females and the males are hanging around just defending them from other males. And then the both eggs and in this case sack alevins still in the gravel. The advantage of gravel is that, as you can see, it leaves a lot of empty space uh, in between the rocks and the water can circulate. And that percolation of the water, like the way the, the water may per percolate in your coffee maker, is basically bringing oxygen into the nest and removing the products of the uh, metabolism of the eggs and the alevins out because they are releasing uh, CO2 and they're also releasing um, uh, urea, which basically is a waste, nitrogen, the way that we would be uh, release, re releasing our urine. In the case of the fish, is straight urea into the, uh, the environment. And that would basically uh, intoxicate them if, or suffocate them in the case of CO2. If you didn't have this constant stream of water percolating through the, through the gravel and cleaning the nest of all those products of their metabolism. So it's important for that uh, flow of water to occur. Whenever there is a landslide or there is a lot of suspended sediments in the water and they, after a big uh, freshet, things come down and a lot of that suspended sediments starts blanketing uh, the, the substrate and clogging the spaces in between the gravel, these fish tend to be in, in trouble. Uh, many areas, entire spawning beds have been lost during certain winters because there were either landslides or some other type of uh, heavy sediment input in the stream that ended up clogging the spaces and suffocating the uh, incubating eggs and the alevins to death. So that's why the importance of coarse gravel, clean of substrate, fine sediments. Uh, here you can see it's not a very clear picture because of the glare, but you see a lot of little fish. Those are the fry that just emerge. And for a few days, they're kind of congregating in slack water, back eddies, because they are not really good at swimming for or coordinating their movements for the first 24, 72 hours. After that, they start distributing in the stream. And depending on the species, they either start migrating downstream, in the case of chum, for instance, or some of the coho 
that I mentioned with rear in the estuary, or they start looking for positions where they can both feed and hide from predators in the stream. Uh, this is roughly what fry would look like. They're kind of a torpedo shape, very small, underdeveloped. In the case of Chinook, the lower um, fish here, or both coho, they have those marks that we call PAR marks, P-A-R-R, -R, and they are supposed to be there to break the silhouette of the fish and help it blend into the environment. Uh, here, they are very obvious because they are against a white piece of marble, but when you have them in the water and they actually have a slightly different coloration, more attuned with the uh, color of the gravel, they are very difficult to spot unless they are moving. And once they get into the summer months, these fry start growing a deeper body, the nicer belly, they're chubbier. And this is the stage in the summer where biologists call them PAR, P-A-R-R -R, again, because of the name of their march. This is a coho salmon. And just for you, in case you're curious, you, we, one of the things you use to tell them apart from baby Chinook that look very, very similar is the shape of the anal fin. This kind of um, semi-crescent shape is a little bit like a crescent uh, with the leading edge longer than the rays at the base is unique in coho. Uh, in the case of Chang would be pretty much a straight line here you wouldn't have these longer leading rays that sometimes looks a little bit like a tropical fish. And also the size of the par marks relative to the space uh, can help you tell them apart. Uh, but in general, uh, they would be uh, very similar to the eye of the beginner. Now, they may, the par will stay, as I mentioned, in freshwater in the case of coho, or actually move in the fall into the estuary. Now we know that. But when they are actually ready to move into the ocean, they start changing their coloration. They start losing their par marks and they start also changing their physiology. So there are three changes here that are associated with the, sorry, with the migration into the estuary and coastal waters, which is smolting is the process that we refer as smolting. And the fish at that stage are called smolts, S-M-O-L-T-S. And the smolt will have a migratory behavior in a downstream direction. They know where they're going and nothing seems to be able to stop them. So there is that clear change in behavior. They're not just sitting around. Uh, they change their appearance and you can see uh, the, the marks disappear. They are better prepared to basically blend with open waters where things are either silvery, if you're looking from below upwards, in the case of a predator looking for fish, uh, the glare in the surface looks um, silvery and that's why their bellies are white and silvery. And then if you're swimming above the school of fish, these fish over time will turn either green in the case of um, coho or blue in the case of Chinook and you will be able to uh, meet kind of, they blend again with the type of colorations you see as you're not snorkeling close to the surface and looking downwards and the fish are there with their blue backs or green backs and they're more difficult to see. So there is that change in appearance. And most importantly, what is a drastic change is their physiology. We won't get into a lot of details now because I see that I'm kind of slow at making progress through my, through my slides, but basically um, they need to start changing the function of their kidney and the function of their gills because they need to start um, retaining water and getting rid of salt. When they are in fresh water, they are overhydrated. They get a lot of water, so they need to get rid of the water and they need to retain any salts that they have assimilated through their diet or their water intake. Once they move into the estuary and then into the ocean, it's the opposite. Too much salt uh, and the water is being lost. Uh, think of, about it because a way of remembering it is people in a, a draft in the ocean uh, when they are uh, surviving a, a, a shipwreck, uh, they actually die of thirst. They are dehydrating and they, there is an accumulation of salt in their skin and, and on the, around the ears and eyes. Uh, basically, um, you need to have a system by which you get rid of the salt and you retain the water no matter what. And this is basically what their physiological change allows them to do. Here you have a school of fish entering uh, open waters. Now we are going to relate this 
life history uh, to the habitat, and the habitat is on the, in this case, we're not going to focus on the ocean, we're going to look at the landscape upon which half or more or, or an important portion in, ad in addition to the reproduction of these fish occurs. And for the purpose of understanding the influence of land use on the aquatic habitat, we tend to divide the landscape on watersheds, uh, which is basically the entire drainage area that has a common outlet in the case, in this case, the mouth of the river into could be a lake or could be the, the estuary. And all the high elevation points in that landscape are forcing the water that comes in as rainfall or snow down a particular single path that eventually reaches the mouth of the river. Imagine that anything raining from these um, ridges on the other side will end up being part of a different watershed. So they are kind of clear to identify by the topographic limitations. It's an area of land bound by these topographic features that drain water to a shared destination, such as a lake stream, estuary or ocean. It captures the precipitation, filters and stores the water and slowly determines its release. Now, in that watershed, we're going to have different elements that make the habitat of the fish. And they are not that clear cut, but we tend to classify things in science or in any case when we're studying things in order to make our communication easier. So I just decided to separate the habitat of the fish in four main components. And I think this encompasses everything. The main one and first one obviously is water. No water, no fish. So that, that's clear. And we'll get into a few more details in a second. Second one, and in the case of these fish, as well as other fish that also spawn in freshwater like lamprey, the substrate is very important. Third, we're going to look at instrument structures, basically boulders and logs, and also the substrate itself that provides certain functions beyond what we uh, consider uh, necessary for reproduction. And finally, the riparian vegetation that I mentioned earlier that is contributing to some of these processes and becomes part of the fish habitat at different times. Um, before I get into the details of the components, I would like to see if there are any questions with regards to the life history, the life cycle that I just covered. We do have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, the first one is on your very first slide. Did you say four to five pockets per couple? Uh, it depends on the species because I'm just talking about a bunch of salmonids. Uh, I have to generalize. Uh, we are looking at five species of Pacific salmon and two species of trout that are actually Pacific salmon, but we call them trout, uh, cutthroat and, and rainbow slash steelhead and the five species. So there is a lot of variation. If we were looking at cutthroat, we would probably be looking at two or three pockets or nests within a red, while if we were looking at Chinook, we'd be closer to nine or 10. And they may repeat that for another red with another four or five. Females may spawn for over a period of two to three days before they're totally wasted. So there is a big range of variation. Uh, the larger the fish, a rule of thumb, the more eggs up to four or 5,000 in the case of a Chinook uh, that they are going to lay. And they tend to put between two and 600 per nest. So you can do the math. Okay. And what time of year do we often see the spawning happening here in Oregon? Okay, again, it depends with the species, but uh, normally fall, fall is the peak uh, of everyone's activity for this because uh, the, the eggs do very well in cold water and cold oxygenated water. And uh, so you would start seeing fish coming in to spawn, well, Actually, the, the spawning activity, and I separate it from the coming in because some species enter the river early. For instance, spring Chinook, as many of you may know, enter the system in the spring, therefore their name. And that's because they go so far inland, let's say to the Umatilla, Pendleton, uh, way up in the Columbia, that if they enter in the fall, they would never make it on time. So they enter the big rivers in the spring. They hang around in pockets of cold water, which are becoming less and less abundant. And if they survive the summer hanging around in the river, then they move into the smaller tributaries to spawn again in the fall. They all tend to spawn in the fall, regardless of where, when they enter the river. Um, coastal Chinook would are fall Chinook, so they would be fall spawners. 
Coho would be fault spawners. By fault, basically, it's after the main rains. Uh, there isn't a date, but uh, in some years when I haven't seen good rain until the, about Christmas time, probably I think it was 2009 or 2008, we had a very dry fall. Uh, fish weren't coming in. So if you were looking for them, you were out of luck. But normally we have a good freshet by sometime in November, uh, late October even, and that's when I would start seeing uh, Chinook and Coho making into many of our coastal streams and even uh, the, the lower Columbia. Um, now, steelhead, and because these fish are, are, have all these different life histories, uh, steelhead may come to spawn in, in the winter, spring, summer, and fall. Uh, they actually don't come in huge numbers. There are peaks that we call summer, summer steelhead and winter steelhead, but you can actually find steelhead spawning pretty much throughout the year, but in very few numbers, and they don't produce these big dramatic runs that we're more used to see in what we call salmon. Um, but mind you, they're all on Corinchus, the same genus, so they are very closely related genetically. We didn't know that until the 90s when we realized steelhead was a salmon rather than a trout. Um, any other questions? Yeah, so um, how long does it take for smolts to adapt to the salt water environment? And then how long does it take for the adult salmon to adapt to the fresh water? Oh, that's a very good question. And again, I love to use the phrase, it depends, because with these species, since I'm covering the different ones, uh, I have to make a broad uh, description. But smolts would probably take, um, I would say, a few days to weeks. And the behavior I have observed myself in Coos Bay is that they actually don't just plunge in the um, brackish waters uh, within hours. They tend to move in and out, especially if there are no tie gates moving their, uh, blocking their move with the tide. And they may be sitting on the edge of the fresh water uh, because fresh water and salt water does, don't mix very well, uh, different densities, but there is a wedge of seawater going underneath the fresh water and they keep going up and down and the size of the lens and the depth changes. These fish seem to be managing to uh, basically put a toe in the salt water for a little bit and see how it feels in my uh, imagination and then go back to where they are still uh, regulating well and gradually they start adapting and coping with more and more and more salinity in a way that doesn't stress the heck out of them. People have done experiments throwing fish that they got in fresh water and salt water. Um, there are some survivors, uh, but we don't know what happens with that stress later on. They may die a few days later and nobody sees them, but there is very fast high rate of mortality when you do that. So they obviously need between days and weeks to cope with the change. And in the case of the upcoming adults, uh, I would say it's a matter of, all, well, it depends on the species, uh, but they tend to arrive between days and weeks earlier into the estuary where they're transitioning from, let's say, waters that had 30, 33 parts per million of uh, salt to waters with 22, 18. So you see a gradual decrease. So they mill around the estuary, the mouth of the river, and then when they are waiting for the um, signal in terms of big rain coming down towards them from the streams, then they are better prepared to deal with the fresh water. But there are stocks and populations in small coastal streams within a, without a clear estuary that actually they make that transition within hours and they seem wow. to survive. So last one for this session, um, did you say, someone's just clarifying, did you say that now it's believed that some coho finger link spent a year in the stream and some are now thought to spend part of that maturity time in the estuary? Yes, uh, about, and I just finished uh, reviewing a paper that is coming out in the Canadian Journal by people from ODFMW, it was a very good paper. And uh, these confirmed studies that were published in 2014 about, and it's interesting that about everybody seems to find about 70% of the juvenile coho remain in fresh water until they are a year old and then they move into the estuary. And there is that 30% and it changes from year to year, okay? And that's, uh, you may find some years 20% and other years 40%, but the average is 30%, a third of the population moves within weeks 
to the estuary and may remain there for the rest of their year until they migrate with their siblings that are coming down from the freshwater and they all leave the river at the same time. Or there are a few that have been counted and they are difficult to tag and retrieve and that's why we talk about a few, uh, but it's, they may make 10 or 20, 12% uh, of the population that actually from the estuary, the next winter they move up into freshwater again and we call them nomads. And those nomadic fish uh, go freshwaters, brackish water, freshwater again, brackish water, and then salt water, all within 14 months. So it's a much more complex life history than we ever anticipated. <clears throat> and it stresses the importance of estuaries for coho that we never even pay attention to. Sure. Great information. Well, I'll let you go on and we'll have some more questions at the end. Okay. So uh, we're going to deal with water briefly. I won't give you a chemistry class right now, but basically we have two different types of environments for fresh <coughs> freshwater fish. And in science, we like difficult words. So I'm just going to share a few with you. But basically we have lentic bodies of water, which are stagnant sitting for the most part, lakes and ponds, and lotic, the flowing systems, the rivers. So we have both lakes and rivers, some fish, uh, most of the ones we can think of here on the coast or the Willamette are associated with flowing rivers. But in the case of Sokai, part of the life history in the early life history in particular is spent in lakes. Also, most Sokai populations are associated with systems with lakes, except for some Sokai runs in Vancouver Island where they don't rely on lakes. So there's always the exception. And, uh, and basically others remain in lakes throughout the entire life history. And there is a case of a landlocked sockeye that we know as cockney. It's a much smaller uh, salmon. It is a little version of a sockeye and they spend their entire life cycle in a lake and they only go to a little by tributaries to spawn. Uh, so there you go. Uh, in terms of diversity of expression of life histories, they, they run a full spectrum. Uh, we also have to look at water column depth when we characterize habitat and the discharge. Discharge is very important. Basically, it's the amount of water that comes down the river per unit of time. You can measure it as cubic feet per second or cubic centimeters per second. The important thing is how much water goes through a specific window, if you put it in the stream, per unit of time. And that gives you uh, basically an idea of uh, the conditions in the system. The fish, the adult spawners, are waiting for high discharge that basically will allow them to navigate over obstacles and barriers much more easily than if they were dealing with a trickle of water. Also the trickle of water that they will experience in September or late uh, summer in general is also hot, which is not good for them. These fish actually thrive in colder waters. So the big discharge of the fall when the freshets start is, a, is an indication that things are getting better for them to try to make it upstream and spawn. And the temperature conditions are becoming better and better as the temperature drops. Um, <clears throat> things that we look for when we study the environment for these organisms is the temperature. And again, the colder, the better. Dissolve oxygen. These fish require high levels of oxygen in the water. They're very sensitive to drops in oxygen concentration. Well, other fish, if you had uh, minnows or carp, they really are tolerant for at least for overnight or many hours of very low levels of oxygen, but uh, salmonids are not. pH, well, pH, unless there is some particular geological feature that may acidify the stream, here in Oregon is not a problem. It tends to be around neutral, slightly basic most of the time, and that's a good thing. Nutrients, Guillermo, I think we, uh, you froze up there. Can you, can you come back with us? Can you... All right, sorry about that. Looks like we have a temporarily frozen. So we'll see if he can come back here and we'll 
bring him back up. It was going so well. So just uh, hang on one minute. We'll see if we can bring Jermo back up for his presentation. nutrients affecting the fish indirectly creating algal blooms am i there you're here yep we can okay. hear you uh, yeah, yeah. that's that because my image disappeared i i lost track of whether i'm there or not okay yeah, we, you're we uh just don't have your video but that's fine your powerpoint looks good and your audio is good okay good so uh for oxygen uh these fish thrive in very high oxygen concentrations. We're talking about 12 to 9.5 parts per million. 12 is the maximum amount of oxygen you can actually have in water at uh, atmospheric um, pressure. And uh, if you have more than that, it's because you're actually pressurizing your water. And it's actually an indicator that the, the level of oxygen you find in waterfalls and very rapid rivers is actually perfect for these organisms. Below five parts per million, you start seeing signs of stress in these fish. They start swimming in a lethargic way. Some of them start looking like they're drunk, their bellies going up is pretty bad. And that may happen at night in certain streams where there is a lot of vegetation and if there are algal blooms, more so. Um, the temperature for growth that you would like to keep if you had a hatchery and you wanted to uh, grow the fish to convert uh, basically fish food into fish body mass at the best rate, you will keep them between 52 and 58 degrees Fahrenheit. Anything above 74 degrees and especially 84 degrees is lethal for most of these fish. There are cases when actually I suspect that it's not the temperature itself that kills them, but basically they starve to death because there have been experiments with high temperatures, uh, one of them, the famous one in uh, Mount St. Helens, where the fish are, uh, coho salmon were released in creeks that were on the top of what was left of the mountain, no vegetation, nothing to cool them down. Uh, it reached temperatures above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And some of the creeks, they look like little artificial troughs uh, that they use. Uh, they added a a frozen shrimp pieces for food and the fish kept eating that. And there were no mortalities over a period of three weeks. While in another system where they didn't add supplemental food, the fish died, which basically gives you an idea that is their cranked up metabolism by these high temperatures that demands so much more food that happens to be at times when it isn't in the environment because in the middle of the summer, there is a drop in productivity of insects that the fish would actually starve to death. And then the, another element important in terms of water quality is low turbidity. Consider that these fish are visual hunters, visual predators. If they cannot see because they are in the middle of a foggy environment, their odds of finding prey are very low and that also affects their performance. Um, I mentioned that after water, uh, I wanted to concentrate on the substrate with regards to what was important for salmonids and other spawners in freshwater like lamprey. The type and composition is very important. Uh, particle size is key to selecting appropriate spawning beds. Uh, clay, silt, sand are bad news in many ways, while gravel and cobble is what they're looking for when they're going to reproduce. Um, the composition is something that we classify the substrate depending on the proportion of all these different size classes of materials. Uh, the coarse substrate is what is important, dominated by gravel and cobble. And basically, it not only is important for fish spawning, 
but it's also a good bed for produ pro producing invertebrates or aquatic insects and other bugs, maintaining position in the stream, and they are associated with the clean water column that helps them detect prey. I explain a little bit more of that in a second. So first important role or association of coarse gravel with the fish is for reproductive purposes as we discussed earlier. But second um, is the production of bugs. Basically, if you have sand or silt, you only can find uh, creatures, small insects and other uh, microorganisms uh, that microorganisms in this case that will bury in the silt or sand or they will be floating in the uh, water column like plankton. But you wouldn't find this type of invertebrates like this mayfly shown in this picture where they're basically foraging on the algae that grow on the rocks. For that algae to grow on the rocks, on the gravel, you basically have to have a clean water column, not a lot of sediment raining on that, on that gravel because otherwise it would blanket the algae layer and would kill it. And when you have that algae layer, basically that slime that makes the rocks slippery when you walk in a creek is basically a patch of grass for these invertebrates. They are actually grazing of that algae and they live in the uh, in high concentrations in the riffle or more rocky portions of the creek. Now, as they uh, basically eat a lot of that uh, algae, they decide to go to other, another patch to forage elsewhere. And that's when they release themselves and the current takes them down and the fish are waiting in pools or other areas with slack water hiding in behind rocks or um, uh, logs and they take a little um, run in the direction of the bug that is drifting and nail them. So basically what we call these fish, they are drift feeders and the stream is bringing the food towards them the way a conveyor belt would work with the luggage at the airport. They basically need to sit in one place where they don't spend a lot of energy and the water will bring to them the food. And they tend to come in waves because a lot of the insects release themselves from the rocks and drift to another patch of uh, algae that they can forage on at dusk and at dawn. And they develop those timely skills to avoid being detected by predators and being eaten. But of course, over millions of years, the fish also develop the behavior of knowing or being prepared or more active at those times to be feeding on the higher or increased drift that occurs at those times of the day. Uh, you can see in this uh, painting, uh, cutthroat trout sort of hiding behind either a boulder here or uh, there are the root wads of a tree on the shoreline here. And basically this is to remind ourselves that the fish, because they are living in a treadmill, they try to really look very actively for spots of slow water velocity, spots where they can basically just sit without fighting the current all the time. But spots that are at the same time near areas where the water will be, uh, jets of water will be carrying drift. So they can just make a little jump, feed and go back to their station. And we call those spots feeding stations and salmonids are very territorial and defend those feeding stations from other salmonids and other fish. And they are, there's a whole gamut of hierarchies in terms of who the protect those or the best feeding stations and which ones are the subordinate fish that don't end up getting any good real estate and have to be sort of moving around trying to find food by other means. Um, and this slide is here to remind ourselves that you see when you have coarse substrate, it is a reflection of uh, water with relatively little material in suspension, clean, clear water. And that's perfect for these fish that are visual predators. When we have situations like this after the landslide, this is in British Columbia, probably 20 years ago, where I took this picture, uh, that cho chocolatey brown um, water is not good for fish, particularly the ones that are incubating in the gravel at that time, where in this picture you see, maybe not too clearly, but trust me, all the gravel is blanketed with a thick layer of that silt that basically is suffocating anything that is incubating there. If the landslide occurs late in the spring, 
when the fish are out of the gravel, uh, they are lucky and in that case they can move away. What happens if it, the landslide occurs later and the fish are out of their nest is that this blanket of seal basically kills all the algae and the food for the fish will basically disappear because the bugs that were eating the algae will have to migrate elsewhere since they will find very little food here. So you may render an entire um, tributary or a long reach of a tributary into something that is very unproductive from the standpoint of the fish. Uh, now, mind you, landslides are natural, but what we have done with a lot of our land use and removal of trees and building of property that disturb soil is increase their frequency and their magnitude, and that is the problem. Now, when we talk about the components, we had in-stream structures as a third in our list. And basically, the, it comes down to two things, large wood and boulders. And as we go down the creek from the headwaters, the boulders become less and less important, and the logs become more and more important in terms of creating structure, complexity, and pockets of high water velocity versus low water velocity. When you see a system like this, when there is a little rapid on one side, sort of a slack water above a fallen log or, or a boulder, and uh, quiet shoreline waters and fast moving waters through the center shoot, uh, you know that you have a lot of opportunities for different organisms to make a living there. Diversity in this case creates many opportunities. You will have juvenile fish selecting certain areas that are not preferred by uh, adult fish. You will have two, three-year-old cutthroat trout hiding in deeper pools underneath logs while the juvenile may be foraging in the open calmer waters, but that are close to some of the riffles where they can find a lot of the uh, insects that they, they rely upon. But then even the insect population itself will be different from the faster moving waters to the slack water and you will have different species and you're maximizing the amount of organisms or basically animal matter that can be produced by a stream that is receiving the energy of the sun and is also taking advantage of opportunities to grow algae and, and different types of microorganisms in that water column that insects and then fish are going to uh, depend upon. Now, the large logs, as I said, as you go further down in the system, become not only bigger as we move down from the headwaters where you may start, if, where you are very high up, you may have only shrubs or very, very small trees. The larger logs or key pieces of wood become key in shaping the channel and also in slowing down the migration of the gravel. Gravel would be moving down very fast if it wasn't for these obstacles. And we've seen an example in the Olympic Peninsula where a hydrologist from the University of Washington, Montgomery, uh, ran an experiment with four channels, all very similar uh, in high slopes uh, terrain. And in two of the channels, they removed all the large pieces of wood while they left the other two channels un untouched. And the assumption was that with this little manipulation, they were going to observe that the gravel from the clear uh, channels was going to disappear, disappear over a period of a couple of winters. And uh, they the channel was going to be basically dug down all the way to the bedrock. And in the other case, nothing was going to change. Well, to their surprise, the job of removing the gravel didn't take a couple of winters. With all the rain that comes and characterizes the Olympic Peninsula. Basically, the gravel from the ridges that they treated was gone within one winter. When they went and checked the following spring, the system in those areas was all the way down to bedrock. And in the other two channels or three channels, as they anticipated, nothing had changed. So it's clear that the downstream migration of the gravel is kept in check by these large pieces of wood. But the gravel still moves, but it moves so much slower that it allows for recruitment of new gravel coming from banks further upstream or even the headwaters where boulders originate and they're weathered away and broken and slowly integrated into the um, bedrock, I mean, sorry, the bed load of the material in the channel, that there's always a balance between withdrawals and deposits as if it were a well-managed bank account. 
if you remove the wood, the gravel is taken out much faster than it can be recruited. Uh, also, the piles of wood that basically accumulate where large pieces of wood are falling in the first place, they also provide shelter to the fish in the middle of the winter in the big freshet periods. Here you see this area underneath this log pile is very conducive to a number of fish finding shelter there because being in the fast flowing waters with low temperatures and no food is not a lot of fun for them. They're actually looking for places. They are very lethargic when the temperatures drop and they, they need to find spots with very little current or they basically um, are wasted away. They burn all their energy trying to fight the current and they don't make it. Also, those same piles of wood are critical when the spawners are coming up the stream and they are actually in holding areas trying to avoid being eaten by bears or eagles and they can hide in between the, the fallen uh, woody material. And now we make it to the riparian vegetation, the last in our list, which as you know, is the vegetation uh, growing adjacent to the stream between the bank and the upland. It's basically the area where the plants are normally keeping their feet wet, so to speak. And there is a composition in that plant community that is unique to that zone of transition. If you go past a certain point, many species start disappearing because it wouldn't be wet enough for them. And you are into what we could call here the upland uh, community. Um, it is terrestrial, clearly, to the eye of most observers, but its functions are integral to the aquatic habitat. And we already discussed some of the reasons why that's the case. So here we have a little diagram showing what we might call the riparian area. And they can be forested, which is the uh, experience many of you may have. But if you're in Eastern Oregon, the riparian areas may be basically uh, represented by a unique community of forbs and grasses that you don't find anywhere else. And they also playing in many ways, some of the same roles, except for the large, large wood that would be absent. Um, so in terms of what it provides to the fish habitat, well, the large wood that we already discussed in detail, uh, basically this is to remind us that it, it shades the stream and it helps to regulate the water temperature. Uh, it also provide, uh, provides food. A lot of the bugs come from the riparian vegetation. As a matter of fact, the smaller the creek, the higher up into a small tributary your fish are, the greater the proportion of bugs that are coming from the uh, riparian vegetation versus what they ca it comes from the aquatic environment. So for instance, in small creeks with a canopy, basically the, the branches that close over the creek forming a tunnel, and those small creeks along the coast many times uh, are used by coho and, and cutthroat. Uh, we observe that about 60% of what you find in the fish stomach is uh, coming from the terrestrial vegetation and not from the creek. As you move downstream and you get into bigger channels and the canopy or the branches above your head are more open and you can see the sky, then the contribution of the riparian vegetation in terms of bugs is lesser and you get more light into the creek and there's more algae growing and therefore more aquatic invertebrates there and they start making up for a greater and greater and greater proportion of the food you find in their stomachs. For those interested, uh, we actually do this pumping uh, the stomach of the fish with a little uh, eye drop type of thing or syringe and basically uh, we make them uh, throw up. We don't kill them to do these studies, particularly when we're working with coho, we have to handle them very carefully because of their status. Another element that is important to remember is that the riparian, especially when you have hardwoods, uh, provides nutrients um, on a regular basis. It may become impulses like these, or it may be contributions that come throughout the year, but all this is uh, in, to some degree an input of nitrogen that uh, fertilizes the stream and allows for microorganisms that will be feeding invertebrates that will be feeding fish. So it also provides a lot of energy beyond what the creek receives directly from the sun. This combination of bugs and nutrients from the riparian vegetation basically create the fish habitat and the food that they depend upon. Uh, another role uh, that is important is the stabilization of stream banks a little bit like the big logs in the middle of the channel, slowing down the migration of the gravel to the point that it balances uh, with the input from the headwaters. Well, the erosion here would 
pretty much be a similar example. Erosion always happens. Whenever you have water running downstream, uh, you will have erosion. Um, it's part of the physics of the, of the equation. But you can have a lot of erosion, like you can see in these banks that are kind of unstable and collapsing gradually into the creek. Or you can have an erosion that while there is some carving of the channel here, of the bank here, you would have some deposit depositing and growing and building up on the opposite channel further downstream. So the channel keeps moving over decades or centuries like a uh, wandering snake, but it's always roughly the same shape. It always have sort of a deep uh, pot shape if you do a cross section with relatively high banks, as opposed to what you have here that over time will look more like a frying pan open flat banks, uh, shallower water spread over a wider channel and is not something that is natural in our systems and uh, salmonids do very well in. They like more something like this when you see the pot by mean the vertical walls, deep water rather than shallow and open towards both uh, banks. Um, it's also important to remember, although I'm very fish centric in my presentations, that the riparian provides critical habitat to a lot of other species. Um, as a matter of fact, about in the Willamette Valley, it looks like uh, of the songbirds, 60% of them depend on riparian corridors for their nesting. And I can't remember the number, but uh, bats are also very reliant at uh, some time in their life cycle. And I won't get into bad life history because I'm not too familiar with it. But I was reading an article a couple of years ago about how critical it was for bat populations. So there, and then you have the raccoons and other uh, water loving creatures that are always going to be found in the riparian corridor and seldom beyond. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, an important role um, of the riparian is the increase in the roughness of the terrain to the point that a lot of the water during the flood periods slows down and a lot of the sediment deposits and rains on the banks of the river uh, contributing to the higher quality and, and uh, nutrients availability in that section that makes also for better growth for plants there and that slowing down basically filters the water uh, reduces the peak effects further downstream and there is a lot of the soil that is retained one of the um, problems we may be facing, for instance, this winter is with a lot of the fires. We have lost a lot of forest cover and a lot of standing healthy trees that are going to provide, provide this roughness and soil retention uh, capacity. And we may see a lot of landslides and a lot of dirt and soil washed into the creeks uh, to the point of creating even uh, very catastrophic conditions in some small communities that are close to certain rivers and people have to be on high alert for that. Um, and this is the other view of trapping sediments in the riparian. And, and you can see seasonally the riparian becomes part of the area that the fish can access, and they do. In other parts of the world uh, where the wet season lasts for three to six months, uh, and mainly think about the tropics, you actually have fish that at certain time of the year rely on these flooding events to reproduce and to feed. They eat fruits and they also eat insects or um, a vegetation that wouldn't be available for them if it wasn't for these uh, seasonal floods. So it is hard to draw a line of where the fish habitat ends and where the dry land begins because the water keeps moving. Uh, finally, I think we're close to the end. Uh, an important role in working lands for riparian corridors is filtering the effects of the surrounding land use. On the right here, you have a pasture example, and in the left, you have crops. In both cases, we have a lot of nutrients that could be washed into the creek if it wasn't for the riparian vegetation that creates a filter buffer zone that is going to retain many of these of those nutrients and deliver cleaner water to the creek, either through the surface runoff and in many cases through the underground runoff. And that's all for now. I think that uh, we, how are we doing for time? I hope I didn't go way, way over time.
No, you're great. That was just right on time. So thank you, even with our short delay today. So no problem. Uh, we do have a couple questions and probably a few more questions will come in as people um, think about those. One of them, you mentioned the fires. <clears throat> do you think there'll be an effect on the fry and the habitat? Uh, do you have an idea of whether these fires, what might the long-term effects might be? No, I, uh, I think it would be uh, short-term uh, for this year, there may be serious problems, uh, but uh, since we have fish in the ocean that are going to come back next year, and uh, in some cases, depending on the species, two or three years down the road, there will be an opportunity to bounce back. Um, we have to keep in mind that uh, we, we live in an area, in a region of the planet that has been shaped by catastrophic events, um, earthquakes, fires, landslides, you name it, are part of the menu these creatures evolve with. Our vegetation and our animals evolve with that. Now, the problem they face is that the frequency and the intensity of these catastrophic events is increasing dramatically. So uh, as we know, the fires seem to be bigger and bigger in terms of uh, the areas they cover. And the fire season seems to have extended from narrow window that would have been characteristic of the past. So that's when the problem is going to be to start. When we have those impacts uh, coming very often for a longer period of time, and also on top of that, we have other impacts because we're polluting the water or we are withdrawing water for crops or we're doing this or creating passage problems with tidal gates or dams, then it's sort of a death by a thousand cuts. and. Uh, it is still surprising that these fish make it back. I, I still, I, I'm in awe on how resilient they are. But if we give them the slightest opportunity, they will, they do, they do come back and they spawn wherever they can desperately. Uh, but we are going to see some populations that are going to produce fewer um, uh, juveniles by the spring of next year, I'm sure of that. Um, someone asked when you were talking about measurements, how could a landowner or an amateur measure the O2 concentration? Well, there are little um, devices. Uh, we use, um, yeah, we use a little uh, portable lab with this um, probe that reads us, but there are uh, devices that are like uh, uh, sort of probably not more expensive than the thermometers they use to check us when we get to a hospital these days and you put the probe and it gives you a, a relatively good oxygen reading. Um, the problem for, with oxygen, if you're interested in spending any time and effort measuring it is in the summer. I wouldn't bother from now until the temperature really goes up to even take any, any of your time because there will be, unless it's very stagnant water, there will be very healthy. Well, I was hoping that uh, if I if we stop sharing your screen that you might not freeze up there with your video on, but it looks like we have a freeze up. So I'll take a minute and uh, hopefully uh, yeah. come back and, oh, I think we lost you right at the end there. So let's just take one minute here and um, I'll share about next week and we'll continue answering some questions. We have a few more. So the Forest of Eastern Oregon um, about diseases of conifer needles, twigs, and um, I, but like they'll be um, oh, they'll be presenting next week. So um, and then also we have um, on the Tree School online the Diamonds Under the Douglas Fir will be on Tuesday, November twelfth, and Charles Lefevre will be back with us talking about a variety of truffles and uh, those can be found on the Tree School Online registration. So you can go to those and learn and learn some more. And we'll also, I'm gonna give you a poll here if you would, um, I, just a wrap up poll. And if you'll help answer a couple questions about the presentation. And again, thanks everyone for staying with us today. And we have a few more questions. Um, so while that poll's going, why don't we, go to one of the longer questions because it looks like you're back with us here and uh, and so we have you. So this came in actually pretty early on. 
And they were wondering um, how is financing and progress going on restoring habitat in secondary and third tertiary tributaries of Oregon salmon streams. And so this landowner has a mile of year round creek running through their land with a tributary of the Illinois. And um, they've waited almost 30 years to hope that maybe something would be removed an obsolete or an unused diversion that's downstream from them because they think they have excellent habitat. So do you have any suggestions for a landowner that has, um, you know, lives on a stream that they may want to try and do more restoration or see that there's barriers? What, what type of advice could you give them? And then maybe what's being done throughout the state with these projects? Well, uh, in general, my, my first uh, piece of advice is to work with your local watershed council or soil and water conservation district. Uh, they are the main groups, NGOs that uh, are working with landowners in general uh, for fish habitat restoration, fish passage improvement. Uh, not all of them are created equal, so I cannot um, tell this person how good or dysfunctional his local watershed council is, but most of them are really, really fantastic in many ways. And uh, they obtain money from um, OWEP, Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, which receive funds from the lottery. So the more we gamble, the happier the fish, I suspect. And uh, they, they are grants. And for landowners by themselves to obtain these grants is, I would say, almost impossible unless you really had a coalition of uh, different groups because they expect partnerships. So the landowner would have to be associated with uh, some local NGO, if it's not the Watershed Council and a school and a church and who knows what else. But the Watershed Council would already have those type of networks pretty much oiled and in place. So hopefully, hopefully this person is in an area with a good Watershed Council and they are getting along with them because I know that depending on where you are and at the time in history, uh, there are issues between landowners and uh, watershed council coordinators. I mean, it's human. So, but hopefully, uh, most of the time, those are not the problem, and he or she will be able to uh, address the watershed council and tell them what he or she wants to do, and they should be able to help. I think that's the best scenario possible. That's a great suggestions. And so uh, someone asked kind of today what resources maybe are in the folder. Could you maybe talk about what resources you put in there? And then we'll just let people know that this recording will be available. Someone asked if your slides will be available, but the recording and the PowerPoint slides will be available um, in the resource um, folder that we talk about, or you can go to the knowyourforest.org to the Tree School Online to come back. And it usually takes us about a week to get the recording. Um, do you want to talk about any of the resources that you put and shared out there today? Yeah, I would need to. Uh, is there a way I can look at the box? Let me see. Let me try that for a second, because that way I wouldn't be um, <laughs> talking by memory, but looking at what I put there. But basically, there are chapters. Oh, no. OK, forget it. They did the three, three chapters from the book. Yeah, there are chapters from what we call the Watershed Stewardship Education Manual, which is a program not to be similar to these aimed to a broader audience but basically covering a lot of the same material and one is on uh, salmonid life history and this i guess it's called salmonid biology and then there is another one about stream assessment and restoration and i think i'm the author of that one or co-author on that one and basically gives you some ideas of what we mean and what restoration is all about uh, I didn't talk about that today because there was no time, but basically it is to heal the system so it starts functioning naturally again. It's not doesn't mean removing the landowners, sending everybody back to Europe, healing any human beings around. And No, no. Uh, restoring is not going back to the 18th century. Restoring means making the processes that have shaped that landscape work again, uh, allowing the trees to retain the soil on the banks, allowing the uh, trees to shade the stream and regulate its temperature, allowing basically a lot of the water that rains in the area to make it into the, the creek rather than withdrawing it to send it to a nearby um, watershed like it's common in California, believe it or not. 
Um, so restoring those processes is what restoration is about. And there is quite a bit of information of, on that in that chapter. And then I added a third chapter. I think Derek is the author and you have to remind me if you can see it, Julie, of the title. Uh, I guess it's stream processes, I believe. And that one is kind of uh, adds information or it will be more accessible to people now after listening to how I divided the fish habitat into different components. So uh, yeah, I have those three that I think are clear and basic, but important uh, stepping stones for additional reading later on. Perfect. And then we also added in the wildlife managed forest that you helped us with, uh, with uh, OFRI on the fish habitat and passage publication. So that's in there as well helping answer some of those questions about um, how to get involved with your watershed council. <clears throat> so Good. I think, uh, I don't see any more questions come in right now. We've had um, a lot of people say thank you for the presentation and that they learned a lot of information and that we really appreciate your time. So um, appreciate every everybody joining us today. And again, thank you for the time and all the information on fish habitat and restoration and I appreciate everybody being with us. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate your patience with me and with my terrible uh, network connection. <laughs> no problem, we made it through and uh, not too bad of delay. So thanks again, everybody, and, and have a good evening.